when I was learning about neurology and about neonatal neurology, I was taught that neonatal seizures really aren't considered alongside seizures in older patients, that neonates really didn't have epilepsy, they had acute reactive seizures, uh, and I needed to think about them differently. And, you know, that was reflected in the older classification and terminology, which really excluded newborns. If you looked around, where's the baby? The baby wasn't there uh, in the classification of the epilepsies as recently as 2017. And in the classification of the seizures, neonatal seizures and neonatal epilepsies were excluded. But in the last couple of years, this has been changed. In 2021, there was a new ILAE classification for neonatal seizures. And this is a really important paper that I encourage you all to take a look at. It emphasizes the key role of EEG for diagnosis of neonatal seizures. Tells us and reminds us that seizures might have a clinical manifestation, but EEG only seizures are common. And this makes a lot of sense because unless a baby has a seizure that involves their motor cortex, they're not going to move because of the seizure. And there's no newborn that I know that's gonna tell me that they're seeing flashing lights or have a rising epigastric sensation or something like that. So uh, EEG only seizures, are common. Importantly, events that occur and do not have an ictal rhythm on the EEG are not seizures. This document drops the traditional 10 second rule for neonatal seizures. So I was always taught, and I expect many of you were as well, that a seizure in a newborn has to last for 10 seconds. And if it's less than 10 seconds, we called it a brief rhythmic discharge and didn't consider it a seizure. Uh, that goes away with this new classification uh, and the, the implications for research and for clinical practice are a little unclear about that. Status epilepticus was also not included in this document. Um, typically, we consider status epilepticus as any one hour epic that has 30 minutes worth of seizures. So it could be uh, 30 1 minute seizures or 60 30 second seizures. But that's not in this document. And the other thing that's really in progress and, and needs to be further fleshed out is the difference between acute provoked seizures and epilepsy related seizures in newborns. So this document tells us um, about ways to think about seizures in babies and emphasizes that neonatal seizures have focal onset um, and encourages us to think about epilepsy syndromes, but then really thinks about etiology of the seizures and emphasizes that HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is the most common cause of neonatal seizures. Then there are a number of other etiologies that are highlighted. And I would just caution you that these do not distinguish between acute seizures and epilepsy. And that matters a lot because the way we approach a baby who has a flurry of acute provoked seizures is quite different from a baby who has an epilepsy syndrome. So let's think about that over the next few minutes too. In the neonatal seizure registry, which at the time that this paper was published included seven centers across the United States, we looked at 611 consecutive babies who were diagnosed with seizures in our children's hospitals. And what we found was that um, a qu a quite a large number of them actually had neonatal epilepsy uh, as opposed to acute symptomatic neonatal seizures. And those epilepsies were distributed across the epileptic encephalopathies brain malformations and um, self-limited, previously termed benign familiar, familial neonatal epilepsies. But overall, neonatal epilepsy was about as common as intracranial hemorrhage as an etiology for neonatal seizures at our hospitals. When we looked at the semiologies of the babies who had epilepsy, we found that those who had um, a normal appearing brain MRI and had an epileptic encephalopathy uh, as their epilepsy type, uh, most often had tonic seizures. Uh, and there are, there are other data that have come out since then to suggest that if you see a focal tonic seizure as a primary seizure semiology in a newborn, you should think about an epileptic encephalopathy for that baby. So I urge you to make this key distinction. When you look at a baby who has seizures, does the infant have acute provoked neonatal seizures or is it epilepsy? And if it's epilepsy, take that next step and say, I'm gonna think about a genetic etiology. And we'll try to convince you of that over some time here as well. So the fact is that it's time to think about neonates along with all the other age groups of people who have seizures and epilepsy. And the new ILAE statements are really important and a very good step forward to include neonatal seizures and neonatal epilepsies in the way that we think about 
um, these babies. So that's why we're here today. So this myth is debunked. Let's take the next one. That prolonged treatment after acute neonatal seizures, so we're not talking about epilepsy here, we're talking about acute symptomatic neonatal seizures, uh, might prevent or, or uh, prolong uh, the time to development of epilepsy. So let, let's look at that. We all know that the treatment of neonatal seizures um, has really centered around phenobarbital for a very long time. Phenobarb is the first line treatment for nearly all neonatal seizures, and it's true in clinical practice worldwide. It's very consistent, and this has not changed over time. Uh, and I, I listed a lot of references here just to emphasize that point. But when we think about it, is it different for babies who have epilepsy as compared with those who have uh, acute provoked neonatal seizures? Phenobarb is still really going to be the first line treatment for almost all of these babies, but the duration of treatment might depend on your diagnosis. For most babies with acute provoked seizures, the medicine can be safely discontinued prior to, prior to hospital discharge. And I'm going to show you some data about that in a second. Whereas neonates who have epilepsy usually need long-term treatment. So we need to make that distinction. So let's talk about treatment duration. What we found in the neonatal seizure registry was that the duration of treatment after acute neonatal seizures was quite variable. We had two schools of thinking. One was that we should maintain the medicine at the time of discharge until the baby came back for follow-up in three or six months. And this has really been the historical approach for treating babies with acute neonatal seizures. And in the initial uh, cohort from the neonatal seizure registry, about three quarters of babies went home on medicine. On the other hand, there was an approach saying, maybe it's okay to stop the medicines after the acute seizures resolve and before the baby goes home. So discontinue the medicine prior to discharge. There were some small studies that suggested this might be safe. A randomized controlled trial was funded by the NIH, but it failed due to low enrollment. In our initial cohort, about a quarter of babies went home off of medicine. And the primary predictor of going home on or off of medicine was which study center the baby was cared for. So we said, well, if all the babies in one study center go home on medicine and all the babies in another study center seem to go home off medicine, one of those centers has the right approach and one of them maybe should change. So let's study that. And so we designed this study that we called NSR2 to examine association between the duration of anti-seizure medicine use and 24 month outcomes for babies with acute symptomatic medical seizures. This was a prospective observational study uh, designed as a non-inferiority study where babies were enrolled at nine centers across the United States. All of the centers had a high level neonatal intensive care unit and a high level pediatric epilepsy center. And all of the, the centers followed the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society guidelines for EEG monitoring. Any neonate who had a seizure onset at less than 44 weeks postmenstrual age could be included. They had to have acute symptomatic seizures, could be of any etiology. Babies who had a transient and mild cause for acute seizures, for example, a relatively mild hypoglycemia that resolved with giving glucose were excluded. Uh, clinical events determined not to be seizures, were, those were not included. Babies who had neonatal onset epilepsies, importantly, were excluded from this study. And the baby had to survive past neonatal discharge in order to be included. Our primary predictor was going home with medicines discontinued prior to discharge from the neonatal seizure admission or having medicines maintained at the time of discharge. Our primary outcome for this study was functional development measured by something called the Warner Initial Developmental Evaluation of Adaptive and Functional Skills. This is a telephone functional assessment that has pretty good uh, correlation with the Bailey exam. But our secondary outcome and what matters here today uh, was the onset of postneonatal epilepsy before age 24 months. So we had 305 babies enroll two ended up having to be excluded. Uh, that gave us 303 for a propensity analysis to evaluate the factors that influence our decision to go to send a baby home on or off of medicine. Um, we had pretty good follow-up rates and 90% of our babies had a primary outcome available for us. Anti-seizure medicine was maintained at discharge for about two thirds of the babies. Most of those babies went home on phenobarbital monotherapy. 
the median duration of anti-seizure medicine treatment was six days for the babies who went home off of medicines as compared with four months for babies who went home on medicine. So quite a large difference. And what we found was that their functional development didn't vary based on whether they went home off or on medicines. So you can see here these box plots where the purple are the babies who had their medicines maintained at the time of discharge and the gray, those who had their medicines discontinued at the time of discharge. And those are pretty overlapping data sets at 12, 18, and 24 months. We also looked to see how many babies scored well below uh, the normal range. And um, in unadjusted analysis, it was clear that uh, there was no increased risk for impaired, very impaired functional development at, at 24 months if the babies went home on or off medicines. When we adjusted for propensity, so the, the features that we know about that help us make decisions about whether a baby goes home off or on medicines, we found again that all of the analyses met our, non, our a priori non-inferiority limit. So there was no difference in the functional development at 12, 18, or 24 months, whether a baby went home on or off of anti-seizure medicine. We looked at preterm babies, and there was no difference in preterm babies. And we looked at babies with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and there was no difference in those babies all either. And then we looked at epilepsy. And what we found was that there was no change in the risk of epilepsy by age 24 months based on whether a baby went home on or off of anti-seizure medicines. So 13% of the overall cohort developed epilepsy by 24 months of age. The median age of onset for the epilepsy was seven months. Now, remember I told you that the babies who went home on medications, their, their median um, duration was four months. So most of those babies would have been weaned off of medicines before their epilepsy arose. In the two groups, 11% of the babies um, whose medicines were discontinued developed epilepsy, and 14% of those who had medicines uh, maintained developed epilepsy. And when we did adjusting for propensity to go home on medicines, again, there was no significant difference. Of interest, all of the babies who had very early onset post-neonatal epilepsy at less than four months of age went home on anti-seizure medications. So continuing the medicine did not prevent them from developing epilepsy. So I take from that, that anti-seizure medicines can be safely discontinued prior to hospital discharge. There was no benefit to neurodevelopmental outcome to continuing or discontinuing them. Going home on medicine prolongs exposure though to potentially harmful medicines that do have side effects. Um, Going home on medicine does not delay the onset of epilepsy. The earliest onset epilepsies occurred in spite of maintaining anti-seizure medicines. We know that for epilepsy with onset at less than 12 months, levetiracetam probably works better than phenobarbital for an initial drug choice. So if many of our babies were going home on phenobarb, even if they developed epilepsy, that wouldn't have been the primary choice of medicine for them if they developed it later. And we found that about a third of our babies who had epilepsy by 12 months had infantile spasms. And we know that infantile spasms do not respond to phenobarbital or levetiracetam. So sending them home on one of those medicines wasn't the right thing to do either. So overall, the evidence that I'm telling you about now supports discontinuing anti-seizure medicines for most babies with acute symptomatic seizures before they go home from the hospital. So myth number two is debunked. Uh, the fact is that discontinuing anti-seizure medicines prior to discharge is not associated with an increased risk for postnatal epilepsy. Let's move to the next thing. Let's talk about genetic testing and syndrome classification. Um, in the introduction that you heard um, from Rajesh earlier, he said, you know, does it matter um, if we treat these babies, if we worry about them, what we do? Um, and for a long time, the suggestion was, no, it wouldn't matter. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not true anymore and that it is a major advance that neonatal epilepsy etiologies are now identifiable. Up to two thirds of infants with epilepsy can be classified at the time they present with a syndrome and an etiology can be determined. That matters. 
This leads to the possibility of tailored treatment based on the etiology of the syndrome. Earlier this summer um, came the ILAE's new um, classifications of the epilepsies. And I imagine many of you have really poured over these documents over the last couple of months. And if you have, um, or if you listen to the European Epilepsy Congress, um, this particular figure will already be etched in your soul. And if you haven't yet, welcome. Um, let's get used to this figure where we divide the neonatal or the early onset epilepsies, neonatal infantile epilepsies into three different groups, self-limited epilepsies, developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, and etiology specific epilepsy syndromes. Now there's no way in the world I can go through all of these and uh, still finish you out on time in, in this hour, but we'll highlight just a few. Let's start by talking about the self-limited neonatal epilepsies. Most of these babies are gonna have seizure cessation by six months of age and usually by six weeks. Um, and so what we know, if we can diagnose this syndrome, if we start a medicine, it usually will be able to be stopped within a few weeks. Well, that's good to know. However, we need to counsel the caregivers, the parents and the families that up to a third of babies will have their initial epilepsy seem to subside after a few weeks, but will later in life develop epilepsy again. And there is some risk for learning difficulties and for some minor motor impairment. Importantly, um, genetic counseling is, is key for these families because these epilepsies have autosomal dominant inheritance, inheritance pattern. Let's talk about treatment for these kiddos. Um, this figure was modified from Tristan Sands paper from a number of years ago now, where they took a case series of 19 babies uh, who had self-limited neonatal epilepsies, and they looked to see what was the medicine given right before the seizures actually resolved. And you see the pattern I've highlighted in blue that for each of these babies, as soon as they got carbamazepine, their seizures got better. And the authors um, highlighted that it may be that the earlier we can diagnose the syndrome and the earlier we can start carbamazepine for these babies, the seizure, sooner the seizures can be controlled and the shorter the hospital stay can be. So that's important. And it's the basis of uh, this recommendation based on case reports and case series that carbamazepine or by analogy, oxcarbamazepine are suggested for early treatment of self-limited neonatal epilepsies. Of course, remembering that most of those babies will have received phenobarbital first because we need to do an evaluation to determine what the reason for the seizures is. And most of the babies that we see with neonatal seizures will have acute symptomatic seizures. So we have to do a sepsis evaluation, do our imaging and uh, and so on. So both of these babies receive phenobarb first, but once we think we know what the diagnosis is, um, early consideration of, ox of oxcarbazepine or carbamazepine is appropriate. Then let's talk about the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. You know, here we talk about DEs and EEs and DEEs and really an alphabet soup. Um, and just to clarify, we have the developmental encephalopathies where developmental impairments are really due to the underlying etiology. Then we have epileptic encephalopathies that are pure where the impairment is due to frequent seizures or the epileptiform discharges. And then we have the babies we're talking about today where we have developmental and epileptic encephalopathy and the impairments are due to both the underlying etiology and the frequent seizures or epileptiform discharges. So you think of those on a continuum and the DEEs are right in the middle. So if we look at the DEEs with neonatal onset, call them early infantile developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, this includes the babies we used to call uh, early myoclonic epilepsy and Otohara syndrome. So importantly, we've retired those two terms and we're not calling them EIDEE. The onset is in the first three months of age, so not necessarily all in newborns, but many. These babies have very frequent and very treatment resistant seizures. It's mandatory for the diagnosis that they have tonic or myoclonic seizures. They will have an abnormal neurologic exam either before the first seizure is recognized or very soon thereafter. These babies all have moderate to profound developmental delays, which become more and more evident over time. And their EEGs are severely abnormal. These are the neonates who have birth suppression with just tons of multifocal spikes and really ugly EEGs. We can recognize them at a distance. 
Sadly, we really have minimal evidence at this point for treatment decisions. Um, if a baby is found to have a channelopathy, think of KCNQ2, SCN2A, SCN8A, it's reasonable to try sodium channel agents, again, based on relatively um, limited case series, but consistent case series results. We definitely need rescue plans for status epilepticus or prolonged seizure clusters for these babies. We have to discuss with the caregivers that these babies are at risk for infantile spasms and certainly at very high risk for significant developmental disabilities. Um, so those are babies we're all gonna spend an awful lot of time taking care of. The next DE we'll think about is infantile epileptic spasm syndrome, which includes West syndrome and also infantile spasms in children who don't have hypsarrhythmia or developmental stagnation at the time of diagnosis. And that's based on the fact that um, babies who don't have hypsarrhythmia uh, respond to the standard first line treatments just as babies who do have hypsarrhythmia. So um, we want to make sure that they get treated as quickly and efficiently as possible. These babies have three standard first line treatments that can work, prednisolone, ACTH, and bigabitrin. Um, either alone or in combination and in rapid sequence, sequence if, if the first one doesn't work. Other treatments are simply ineffective. Now, why am I talking about infantile epileptic spasm syndrome? I'm gonna talk about neonatal epilepsies. Um, that's because neonates who have acute seizures are at pretty high risk for infantile spasms. We looked at this in the neonatal seizure registry where we had uh, seven of our nine sites participated, 204 babies. And we looked at their neonatal EEGs, and we looked at their MRIs with the central reader, and we looked at clinical risk factors. And we looked at uh, a number of different ways to analyze the data uh, to develop a model um, through consensus to balance statistical significance and clinical relevance that predicts the risk of infantile spasms. So in these neonates with acute seizures at risk for infantile spasms, there were three main risk factors that we drew out, one for EEG, one for MRI, um, and one for discharge neurologic exam. So for baby, the risk factors were severely abnormal neonatal EEG, so birth suppression, flat trace, very, very suppressed or very, very discontinuous, or more than three calendar days with EEG confirmed seizures, so a lot of prolonged neonatal seizure time. Second, MRI, deep gray or brainstem injury on neonatal MRI. And third, abnormal tone on the discharge exam, which could be low tone, as in the image I have here, or high tone. So babies who had none of those risk factors, none of those babies developed infantile spasms in our cohort. Those who had one or two risk factors had the baseline risk for infantile spasms of the whole cohort, about 4%. But look at the babies who had all three of these risk factors more than half of them developed infantile spasms. That's a very, very high risk group. So this is important because it tells us that infantile spasms after acute neonatal seizures can be predicted based on clinical factors that many of us have at our fingertips at the time that a baby's being prepared for discharge. So this matters a lot for parent education. If the baby has no risk factors, it's not that we're gonna ignore the possibility of infantile spasms, but we can be very reassuring as we counsel families. But for babies who have all three of those risk factors, they deserve some careful monitoring, careful education of families, what do infantile spasms look like? How will you contact me if you're concerned about your baby? And very low threshold for bringing them back for follow-up EEGs. Uh, we work in the neonatal seizure registry with a group of extremely helpful um, and very talented parent partners. And they worked with us to develop the infographic that you see on the right-hand side of your screen today. Uh, that is designed to uh, give to parents of babies with neonatal seizures at the time that they go home or when you first meet them in the outpatient setting. If you're interested, um, the infographic is available free of charge on our neonatal seizure registry website, which is indicated here uh, and is also translated into Spanish. So let's move then to the etiology specific syndromes. And I'm not going to go in depth into each one of these, uh, but just to get them up in your mind. Remembering that most of these etiology specific syndromes that begin in the neonatal or the infantile period really are developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. So these are the severe epilepsies. 
Um, most of the time, they're genetic. We can think about KCNQ2, urotoxin dependent epilepsy, peridoxamine 5 phosphate deficiency, CDKL5, and so on. Importantly, for caregiver counseling, many of these have family support groups, and those family support groups are really outstanding. Uh, and it only takes going to Google if you can't remember the name of the group and putting in the name of the gene and parent. Um, and you may very well find uh, a resource that's very helpful for families. I'd also remind us that good treatment for babies with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies is not just seizure control, right? We're talking about um, developmental delays, intellectual disabilities, movement disorders, autistic traits, very often sleep disorders. Uh, so comprehensive care is really key. Our KCNQ2 DEE um, has really received an awful lot of focus uh, recently, and I would refer you to the gene reviews uh, document from May 2022 for a lot of detail. Um, we expect that treatment resistant seizures are gonna happen in the newborn and infant period. Um, but those seizures may respond to sodium channel blockers, and it's worth a try uh, to see if we can't get those seizures under control quickly. The natural history seems to be that seizures will often remit eventually, but development will remain impaired and intellectual disability is expected. Genetic counseling for autosomal dominant inherent inheritance patterns is important for these families. Pyridoxine dependent and pyridoxine 5-phosphate deficiency developmental and epileptic encephalopathies are also very important because uh, they're cause of very difficult control to control neonatal seizures until you get the right diagnosis and institute the right treatment. Seizure control can usually be achieved with pharmacologic doses of pyridoxine or pyridoxal 5-phosphate. Um, also importantly, uh, early treatment with lysine-restricted diet or L-arginine therapy may be beneficial. And the earlier those treatments are initiated, the better the long-term outcome. Care, caregiver counseling uh, is important for, for these families as well um, to talk about the expected degree of intellectual disability, even if the seizures are controlled, and to talk about autosomal recessive inheritance. This is potentially important to enable really early treatment for future pregnancies. So I would tell you, and I hope that you agree with me, that the new epilepsy classification signals major advances in neonatal epilepsy management. Um, for most neonates, we're still starting with phenobarbital, at least for a short time until we understand the etiology. Um, but with rapid access to genetic testing and with excellent neuroimaging, we can very often reveal a specific etiology if the baby actually has neonatal onset epilepsy. And this raises key opportunities for tailored therapies and for family support. So I hope you'll agree with me that the myth that genetic testing or syndrome classification won't change anything needs to be out the window. The fact is that knowing the epilepsy etiology, very often genetic, and or the epilepsy syndrome can lead to tailored treatment, proactive efforts to optimize development, and appropriate family support. Let's take one more myth that babies can't have epilepsy surgery. We know that for older kids and for adults, it can be really hard to get families and to get clinicians to refer for epilepsy surgery. Well, then take that 10 steps further to get surgical interventions for babies has been really difficult. And part of that is because many of us have believed that it's not safe for epilepsy, for, to do epilepsy surgery for babies. The truth is though, that the early infantile developmental and epileptic encephalopathies are very often caused by structural brain abnormalities. And so, you know, if you have a somatic gene mutation that causes this big dysplasia, maybe that will be amenable to a resective epilepsy surgery. It turns out that surgical treatments for infants with drug-resistant epilepsy really shouldn't be postponed based on age. Early and effective intervention offers the best hope for development, for seizure control, and perhaps for survival. And importantly, in the right hands, surgery can be safe and effective for selected infants. 
But you take, there are a number of case series and, and pretty robust multi-centered uh, collaborations evaluating this, this phenomenon. Here I highlighted just one for you, uh, demonstrating that babies who needed a hemispheric surgery for their epilepsy uh, had a very high likelihood of having an excellent uh, uh, seizure outcome after their surgery. And babies who needed a focal surgery, but not a complete hemispheric surgery, more than half of them had a ILAE class one outcome after their surgery. And these were for babies who were three months old or less when they had their first surgery. At the same time as I was thinking about that paper and this talk came out um, the new position statement from ILAE on the timing of referral to evaluate for epilepsy surgery. Now this is an expert consensus recommendation, um, but it's very clear that early consideration for epilepsy surgery is important and there is no age limit. So both for newborns and for the elderly, if there is a child who has potentially surgically remediable epilepsy, they should be referred quickly. So for infants who have treatment resistant seizures, um, focal or hemispheric dysplasia, an expedited surgery referral to a highly experienced surgery team is appropriate. It doesn't mean that the surgery is going to happen tomorrow while the baby's you know, three or four or five days old, but if we get them on that path quickly, um, may very well have a life altering uh, improvement. So if you're thinking about referring, the answer is yes, let's refer now to a, a high level epilepsy center. And so we're gonna debunk that myth as well. That myth that babies can't have epilepsy surgery is wrong. And the fact is that early referral to an experienced epilepsy surgery team could save that baby's life, could save their development, and will make all the difference in the world. So let's give some time for discussion. And let me remind you that we really need in our field to get away from myths, no more myths. The biggest myth that there's nothing new in the neonatal seizures, I hope all of you can agree on that. The myth that neonatal seizures can't be considered alongside seizures in older patients, I hope you can agree that um, the ILAE has helped us make great strides with the new statements that include neonatal seizures and neonatal epilepsies. The myth that we should be continuing babies on anti-seizure medicines um, to prevent epilepsy after they have acute symptomatic neonatal seizures uh, needs to be tossed away as well. The fact is that discontinuing anti-seizure medicines prior to discharge does not increase the risk for post-neonatal epilepsy. I'll also mention, I have plenty of people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm clever, Dr. Shellhas, I change them from phenobarbital over to another medicine, perhaps levetiracetam, before they go home from the hospital, because maybe it'll have fewer side effects. I'll remind you that our study showed that going home with no medicine was safe. And so no reason to switch over to a different medicine when the opportunity is there to switch to no medicine. And, and I didn't show you these data, um, but we looked at parent and family well-being. And what we found was that family well-being was better when babies went home off of medicine. Next myth that genetic testing and syndrome classification won't change anything. We need to get rid of that as well. Knowing the epilepsy etiology, especially genetic etiologies uh, and or the syndrome for the newborn with epilepsy can lead to tailored treatments, lead to proactive efforts to optimize their development and lead to helpful family support. And I just told you a minute ago that early referral for to an experienced epilepsy surgery team can be life-saving for a baby who has appropriate surgically remediable epilepsy. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't important knowledge gaps. Uh, we know that there's still a lot for us to learn. And we also know that access issues are real. We need to be grappling with this as an epilepsy interested community. How do we provide rapid diagnostic testing equitably? How do we consistently refer neonates and infants with epilepsy to specialty centers? Can we facilitate expedited surgical evaluations for certain infants? And how are we gonna do that? Although there are many neonatal epilepsy associated genes, and I only listed a few, 
most of the etiology specific epilepsies lack effective precision therapies or disease modifying agents at this time. We have a lot of work to do in this space. Importantly, natural history studies are gonna be critical. As we provide new therapies that might be disease modifying, um, we need to be able to define what is the new expected neurodevelopmental and epilepsy trajectory for these infants. And all of these are rare diseases. And that means that we need to work together uh, in robust multi-center collaborations and think hard about innovative, innovative trial designs uh, in order to get to the next level for neonates with epilepsy. So to conclude, I really feel like the future is bright for our field. Neonatal seizures are no longer the stepchildren in the epilepsy world. Neonatal seizures are front and center as, as they should be. Uh, we have far fewer myths than we did even four or five or 10 years ago. And we have more facts and we're gonna work together to do even better. So I thank you very much for your invitation and I look forward to a lively discussion.